Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, you will find question 40 of the Shorter Catechism on page 7. Question 40 there. We found it, Luke. You can read it if you'd like to. Question 40 and the answer, page 7 in the back. Good. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we thank you that we may study the matters concerning your word, what you have taught us, and what is contained in the scriptures for our benefit, for our instruction, and for us to humbly and obediently follow. We pray for the grace of the Spirit to be at work in our hearts now, that this would be a profitable time, well spent, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good, so we've come to the um, part of the Catechism that deals with the law of God. And we're taking quite some time over it, and we will take quite a lot more time because it moves on to the Ten Commandments. Um, it's a very big, important section in the Catechism. I trust you're beginning to get a sense of that. And we ought therefore not to minimize the law of God in our own thinking and understanding of the Scriptures. This question specifically mentions the moral law, and that is as distinct from the, do you remember the two other categories of the law? Ceremonial and judicial. Very good. And uh, we have started to look last time at the ceremonial law. And a little bit of what we're doing now is we're trying to see why the ceremonial law is not completely and in every way finished and done with. But there are still some living principles that are for us and for our benefit. Okay, so, so that's what we're, we're aiming at today, is to try to see in all of the structure of the ceremonial law what, what is still there for us and what benefit we might have from it. So you must understand it as it was, and then from that try to see what um, remaining principles are there for us and for our souls. We began to see that there were three kinds of sacred things um, in the ceremonial law. Right? And we started with sacred people and we looked at the great high priest. We move on to the sacred places today. And the third thing, just for your memory, is sacred things. We'll also come to that today. So, sacred people, sacred places, sacred things, that was what the ceremonial law had to do with the Easter. Like we might have times or occasions today. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing is that what we're going through is very simplified. And even though um, it actually might feel drawn out, it's actually very simplified. So, yes, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that, that are going on that, that we're just going to miss. And, and you'll have to work out for yourselves. Um, but perhaps what, what we, we're doing here is giving a, a taste, um, just a taste. <coughs> but thank you for that, Jesus, good point. Sacred times are actually very important, don't dismiss that. Alright, so then, what were the sacred places under the Old Testament? Yes, very good. Temple and the tabernacle. Two of them, and they both start with a T. So you can remember it easily. Okay. What was the tabernacle? The tent of meeting. It was a tent. It was a tent. But it was more than the tent of meeting. Um, the house for the ark of God. Sorry? The house for the ark of God. 
Yes, it, in it included a special place for the Ark of the Lord. Dwelling yes. Place. The dwelling place of God. Uh, yes, the center innermost part was, was where the presence of the Lord was. Sacrifices were done there, yes. Okay. So in, in essence it was a, a movable tent that they could pack up and carry along to the next place and set it up again. Okay. Um, it was protected a bit from the weather by some coverings. And who planned and designed the tabernacle? God. God. All right. So uh, Moses received the pattern from God. And we are reminded of that in the New Testament, in Hebrews 8. They served a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the... Where was he? Mountain. Mountain. Good. So the pattern came from God. And how did God design it, just roughly and in brief? Um, what was the biggest part of the tabernacle? The outer court. Yes, there was an outer court. Okay, and what was hanging around the outer court? Curtains. Curtains, yeah. And uh, these curtains were very finely made. They were made out of fine twisted linen. And they were specially set at a certain height. Um, and uh, this made a courtyard. Uh, and it was the, the, the size of the courtyard was also specified. And uh, it was made of these finely twisted linen and with bronze bases for the stands that held it up. So that's pretty much what the temple was. Uh, the tabernacle was. Coming on then to, to the, the temple. Yes. Can I say something for the benefit of the young people? Mm. I don't know if the temple maybe sounds strange to them or whatever, and the tabernacle. On YouTube, the parents can help them look. There are such incredible 3D animations and things like that. It, it, it helps so much to have seen the picture of what it actually looks like. Mm. Uh, I find it very, very helpful. Yes, it is helpful to get to have diagrams or, or other helps like that to to get it into your mind. Otherwise, sometimes it's difficult to put all these things together in your in your own head. So that's very helpful. I think there's um, some books also. Can't yeah, thought they not. Uh, yeah, there's a book we've got called um, God's Taint, which is a, a children's book which helps you um, build the taint. Right. Which of course I got into stuff after we'd homeschooled. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's also the ESV Bible Atlas, which is excellent. Yes. Very helpful. Thank you. Jim has commended that before. The ESV Bible Atlas. Very good. Okay. When and where was the first temple built? Remember, there were several temples. Uh, not at the same time. So, in Jerusalem, yes. Who built it? Somebody said Solomon. Solomon, yes. David collected all the stuff for it. Yes. Yeah, but Solomon put it together. That's right. Yeah. So it was actually built um, on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, um, and it was built at the time after the Israelites came out of Egypt 480 years later. Okay, so it took a long time from them coming out of Egypt to actually building the temple. Meantime, of course, they had the tabernacle. was um, on, also we're told, on the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite. That was the place that David had specifically provided for it. Okay, we've asked then uh, um, about the design of the tabernacle, but what about the temple? Who designed the temple? Clever men? 
God. Correct. Just like the tabernacle, the temple was also designed by God. And in this case, as we've already mentioned, David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern that he had received. How did David receive it? Not on a mountain? Uh, no, not from Samuel. We're told in 1 Chronicles 28, let me read it to you, it's interesting. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico of the temple, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and the place of atonement. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms, for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries of for the dedicated things. Okay, there's the things. The dedicated things are the sacred things. And uh, David gives his own testimony in 1 Chronicles 28, the same chapter. And he says, All this I have in writing from the hand of the Lord upon me. And he gave me the understand, an understanding in all the details of the plan. Okay, so it's very important that you, you know, this is not invented by men. And we are similarly not free to worship God in any way that we please and by our own design. But we must worship Him by His design. So there's an important, very important principle that, that continues coming out of the ceremonial worship. How is God to be worshipped in the way that He tells us? We're not free to do as we please. Okay, and then uh, let's talk a little bit about the symbolism of um, things to do with the temple and the tabernacle, but let's stick to the temple. Um, symbolism and what uh, is often called the typology. Uh, what were the things in the temple uh, representing? This is a very interesting subject, and I admit I need to read much more on this. Um, but uh, there, you know, a lot of what happened in, uh, in the temple was uh, symbolic, it was meaningful, it had a particular purpose. Sometimes that's clear and easy to see. Sometimes it's not perhaps all that clear and, and you might be um, uh, guessing a little bit. But, but if it's a, a, an educated uh, biblical understanding of the thing, it may, not, it may not be that you're completely on the wrong track. But beware, when it comes to um, the typology and the spiritualizing of the, the scriptures, uh, good men can, can become, uh, can become uh, very much mistaken. You can go to town, you can go completely overboard. All right? Uh, I've not read, uh, has anyone read Bunyan's Solomon's Temple Spiritualized? Uh, I probably haven't read it for good reason <laughs> because I think he, he, he does a bit of that uh, from what I've heard. Have you heard anything to that effect? No, no his little book on prayer is very helpful. And he, he takes aspects of the tabernacle and the temple. And I think he's, he's seen something that we often forget. Um, we often think of the temple as the place of sacrifice. Uh, that is true, but it's not the essence of the temple. The temple is not about sacrifice. The sacrifice was a means to the end. The temple was about the presence of God in the midst of His people. Yeah. And you see, we, we have to have temples in the New Covenant. We have to have the Lord present. And that's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians. And in Hebrews. And uh, so we, we're not free from the ceremonial law. We are free in it, <laughs> if I can put it that way. It's not a problem. Thank you. All right. So let's let's try and think about this uh, a little more. Um, so what did the uh, temple and tabernacle uh, typify or symbolize? Well, uh, Jim has explained it. Um, the presence of God in the midst of his people. Um, but uh, is that the only thing you can see? In it, you see, you, you have um, you have God with us, the presence of God amongst men. 
Christ himself to be seen uh, in, in and through the tabernacle of the temple. And I think, yes, it's true. Um, because in him there is the, the union of his divine person with, the, with his human nature. And so we're not surprised when we find him speaking about his own body as the temple. Uh, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They're referring to his body. Okay, so the temple had an outer court. Uh, what other divisions did it have? Did it have any sections or rooms? Yes. Hello? Yes. 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 Yeah, it had, it had quite a few, yes. And the main ones? Yes, yeah, so there was the holy place and also the most holy place, uh, which perhaps are the two that we should focus on. And these are spoken of in the scriptures. Let me read to you just so that you're clear. Make a curtain of blue, we read in Exodus 26, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine, finely twisted linen with cherubim worked into it by a skilled craftsman. So there again, the work had to be done beautifully and perfectly. All right, what kind of worship? And service does God require of us? Worship. Sloppy no. worship? No. Okay, so, so these principles are there as well. You give Him your best. Are you giving Him your best today? Worked into it by skilled craftsmen. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood, overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasps and place the Ark of the Testimony behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Put the atonement cover of the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. Okay. And uh, is there any significance in these rooms and, uh, in connection with the outer, outer court? Uh, as Jim has, has told us the presence of God amongst his people. Well, of course, the temple was a place for the people to go uh, and also not to go. So the outer court, uh, everybody could go in there. And uh, perhaps there's some parallel between the outer court and, and the outward church or the visible church where uh, there's a mixture of, of anyone who uh, is... Uh, the member or within the orbit of the visible people of God. Um, so there are sinners walking in the in the court in the outer court, but there are also saints walking in the outer court. Sorry, that was the, the, the outer court were the Gentiles allowed there, or was the Gentiles court separate in the outer court? Yes, I, uh, as I recollected. Um, the Gentile, the court of the Gentiles is the most sort of outward and then there was, as we noted in Mark, there was the court of the woman um, and and then would the, have been more outside they were outer both court. in the outer court okay. uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it may be helpful to know that you had to be clean to enter into the outer court you had to be, so you had to be uh, if you're a man, you had to be circumcised, and you had to, if, if you had contact with a dead body, for example, you had to have been cleansed, in other words, baptized, water sprinkled on you, and so on. Uh, so there were degrees of the, uh, well, maybe not overcomplicated. So that's why I think in the Herod's temple, they added other facilities, as it were, to the temple. Um, but I think it's very helpful for us to think of the temple like the church because you, know, you, you can't belong to the church unless your name is on the register. And, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that you really belong to the Lord. And, mm. you know, many people who went to the temple clean, outwardly clean and have clean hearts. So. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Okay, so you have then the outer court and where everyone who was clean could go. Um, 
and then you had the uh, Holy of Holies, the holiest place where almost nobody could go, but God's presence was there uh, upon the mercy seat on the Ark of the Testimony. Um, and uh, uh, we have then the presence of God amongst His people, but we also know, of course, God is in heaven, and yet He's with us. So um, some have said, well, the most holy place also has um, overtones of heaven in it. And one day, the Church of God, glorified and triumphant, will be uh, basking um, in the presence of the Lord um, permanently. Then, well, the question is, well, what about the, then the, the holy place? What, is, what could that represent? And some have answered, well, it's could represent the invisible church on the earth. And I'm not just sure how they get to that kind of thinking, but people have given quite a lot of thought to this, and some some of it is really quite valuable, and some perhaps less so. And um, be careful of being too imaginative. So that's the lesson there. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about the sacred things. Um, there was one thing right on the outside. Uh, one object um, that was quite important. Now, I'm not thinking here of any of the altars. Can you think of a, a rather large, important object in the outer court? The label of the wash basin. Yes. What was the wash basin made out of? Bronze. Bronze, correct. Yes, and why was it important? For cleansing. For cleansing, yes. So what did it have in it? Water. Water, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. And what did they cleanse with it? Utensils. Uh, no. People. And particularly? Hands. Okay. So it was placed um, on the outside and it was particularly placed between the tent of meeting and the altar. Uh, so that you would need, if you were going to go into the tent of meeting, you would need to be cleaned. Roger? Yes? Wasn't it an enormous quantity of water and then they had other containers where they put water into for people to use? So you didn't have to put your hands in the big... In the big get yeah, there was quite a lot going on. No, so, no. so, yeah. I think they had several different things on wheels. Yes. Yes, it's, it's interesting to read it because it's, it's very detailed and the Lord's instructions are enormously detailed. But let's just look at the simple matter of cleansing because we, we really need to move through this as quickly as we can. Aaron and his sons had to wash in it. And what do you think happened if they didn't wash? They couldn't die to the holy and the holy of holies. And if they did without washing, what does the Lord threaten them with? Death. Death. Right. So was the Lord serious about his pattern being kept? Yes. Most certainly. Is he still serious about the way in which we are to serve and worship him today? Yes. Certainly. And are, is the life of our souls at stake and our bodies yes. at stake if we, if we uh, trample his courts? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll read that to you from Exodus 30. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. And repeatedly. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting an offering made to the Lord by fire, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. So why do you think there was um, such a severe penalty? Perhaps I'll already have explained something of it. What else do we learn from this severe penalty? God is holy. God is holy. Very much so. And we? Are unclean. And we are unclean, unholy. 
We are sinful. And so what is needed? Yes, as you sit here today, do you need to be cleansed? Yes. Yes, and how are you cleansed? By the washing of the water of the word. Okay, yes, yeah, that's good. And how else are you cleansed? By the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. Yes, we're told in 1 John, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Sorry, I thought there was a difference between cleansing and purifying. Uh, yeah, there probably, yeah, there pro there probably is. Uh, Jim could talk to you at some... <laughs> Not... <laughs> okay. Alright, that's, that's a good answer. Water can only cleanse, blood can purify. Uh, okay, well... Maybe. <laughs> no, I think that I think that the we're, we do draw a right um, parallel here between the water of the basin and the blood of Christ. It's not two different categories. It's the, it's the cleansing or slash the, the purification that's important. Okay, and if you're not cleansed from your sin, are you going to die? Yes. 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 Well, the wages of sin is death. Okay, what kind of animals were sacrificed? Clean ones. Uh, good, clean ones, yes. Bulls, yes. Okay, bulls, clean ones. Any further answers there? Lambs. Lambs, yes. Birds, yes. Goats. Oh, goats, sorry, mosques. Don't help us to hear each other. <laughs> Yes, they had to be perfect. They had to be clean, number one. They, you, you couldn't bring a, a perfectly formed, unclean animal into the temple. So it had to be clean, but then it also had to be perfectly free of any blemish or any imperfection at all. And uh, Leviticus is clear on this. Chapter 22. Do not bring anything with a defect, because it will not be accepted on your behalf. Why did it have to be without blemish? What's the significance of that to us? Christ. Christ was unblemished. But wait a minute, Christ was the God-man. Wasn't he unblemished in his divinity? And does that apply to his divinity or his humanity? His humanity. His humanity as well. His humanity was perfectly spotless and unblemished. How do we know that? The Bible tells us. That's always the answer. <laughs> the Bible tells us. The, the answer that gets you 10 out of 10 is when you now recite the passage where the Bible does. <laughs> okay, it's 1 Peter 1. It's one of the places. We know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Right, then uh, the, the ceremonies. There's one important point I, I want to get to, so let's, let's press on here. Uh, the ceremonies. What was so instructive about the various ceremonies when it came to these animals and them being sacrificed? Right? It wasn't just a simple kill the animal done. There was various cer ceremonial matters to do with it. What were those ceremonial uh, matters? There was the shedding of blood. Okay? And then sprinkling as well. Alright? So let's lump it together and just speak of the blood. It's very important. Um, he, uh, the, the, the priest was to slaughter um, in Leviticus 1 a young bull before the Lord and, the, and Aaron's sons, the priests, had to bring the blood and sprinkle it against the altar. It was burned up right. It was either consumed wholly or in part um, upon the altar with fire. 
priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire and aroma pleasing to the Lord. Again, Leviticus 1. And then uh, any other ceremonial uh, actions that took place? Certainly part of the animal is served. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Offering of incense. Incense was offered. It's offered. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking particularly uh, in, in, uh, about the animal itself. Uh, there was the placing upon the head of the animal uh, the hands of the priest. Okay. He put his head, hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it is then accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. That's, um, that's also important. So those three things. First of all, then, the placing of the sins of the offerers upon the head of the sacrifice. Um, what is signified here for us? We to put our sin on the animal. Yes. And particularly, our sin is upon whom? Upon Jesus Christ. Correct. So when you're reading all of Leviticus, um, this is what you, you must be looking for and you must be taking to your own heart, is that your sins similarly are laid upon Christ and He has dealt with them. Right? We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was there in the sacrifices. And it's there for us to learn. And what about the blood? What does that signify? Oh, sorry, too many. <laughs> June 1st. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay, let's, um, let's look at this closely. Um, Christ's blood was shed for the remission of sins, as June says. This is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of our sins. And the fact that the sacrifice had to be burned up, what does that symbolize? Full atonement. Full atonement, yes. But furthermore, what, is it, what does it tell us? The atonement of God Christ is full and complete, yes. But why the fire and, uh, and the burning? Sins are burned up. Our sins are, okay, burning cleanses, I suppose, purifies as well, There's yes. There's nothing left. There's nothing left, but. Uh, it was the same as the Passover, now the land had to be completely burned mm -hmm. up before they left Egypt. Yeah. It's refined and purified. Refined and purified, yes, yes. All, all of this is going on, but there's one pretty big and obvious thing that you're all missing. Yes. So this poor, this animal is burned up by fire, and surely that is symbolic also of the wrath of God, the infinite wrath of God, which is um, which is upon all who sin. Think of that for a moment. Okay, and this is, this is, please don't miss this point, it's very important. The infinite wrath of God is upon everyone who sins. And uh, you and I, learning from this, must realize that if we have to suffer that wrath of God, we will be consumed by it for how long? Forever. Forever. Because his wrath is infinite and our sins are of huge proportion that they warrant the infinite wrath of God. So you will suffer eternally in hell for your sins. 
because you deserve it. And amazingly, this infinite wrath of God was poured out upon a man who? Perfect. A perfect man? Yes. It was poured out upon Christ in your place as he endured it for you. Did he endure the infinite wrath of God? Yes. yes, he did. But are you hesitant when you answer that? Yes, he was resurrected. He was resurrected, yes. So surely he didn't bear the infinite wrath of God. That's the argument. Because uh, like us, uh, he would have to suffer it for eternity. Isn't that, isn't that the case? So then he couldn't have borne the infinite wrath of God. Because he was God. Ah, because he was God. He was capable of bearing the infinite wrath of God and completing the act. Okay? Whereas we would have to drink it for eternity. It would never be completed. We would have to suffer and be consumed by it forever and ever and ever. And yet, because of who Christ was, and that's why you can't be saved by a mere man, because he was the God-man, he was capable of enduring the infinite wrath of God on the cross. Isaiah 53, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Okay, we've gone beyond the time. Are there any last questions? Yes, I think it is wonderful in a way that um, what was happening in front of the, the temple um, or the holy place, all this ceremonial cleaning and, and offering of the sacrifice, which is necessary now because um, um, we can't see God without first shedding of blood. And so it was all done in front of the of, um, in front of the holy place. It is a symbol that we will never see God without this happening. Because Jesus was then um, our curtain that, that was separating us. Now, right. we, we can go to God. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Right. And those lessons the ancient people of God were well, taught, the thing, but they, and we are taught. They wouldn't understand that, would they? No, they would have understood something of it, yeah. yeah. Right, let's pray. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. The priest would do it on your behalf. Alright, so God also ordained that there should be priests and so on. It's very important. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the lessons that we've learned from the ancient times, which formed part of your law, being an expression of your holy character. Thank you that you taught it to your people and required their careful obedience. And thank you for all that remains to us and so much more than what we've considered today for our soul's benefit and for our gratitude and for our worship of the Most High God. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.